Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, we are going to wait for uh, about a minute for all of our participants to join today's webinar. Uh, we have a very large number of registered participants, so we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to join before we start. Um, we will be recording this uh, webinar and you will be able to find the recording in our YouTube channel and we will put the details of our uh, YouTube channel there. If you have registered for the webinar, you will also receive an automatic email with the link to the webinar recording to watch afterwards. So thank you very much for everyone who is joining us now that you're here on time. I hope that those of you who are joining us from outside of Turkey, um, thank you very much in case your time zone difference is very um, large com you know, compared to that and that it's not too early or too late for you in the day. And for those participants uh, joining us from Turkey, thank you very much. We know it's the end of a, a work day uh, in the middle of the week, so we want to thank you for that. I will be um, the host for today. My name is Melissa Abache. I'm the director of the International Student Recruitment uh, Directorate at Koch University. Um, and I'm very honored to have with us today, Professor Denise Yuret, who is a professor in our Department of Computer Engineering. He has been at Koch University since 2002. Um, uh, you can see his, uh, his website there where you can find all details about uh, his research, the project that he has been involved in and currently is working on. Um, his main topics of research are uh, in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing. He's also the founding director of one of our newest research centers, which was established earlier in 2020 in collaboration with Ishbank, which is one of the largest uh, banks in Turkey. And uh, it's the Koch University Ishbank Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. He's also the founding member of the MI, sorry, uh, yeah, of the <laughs> Artificial Intelligence Lab. And before that, he was uh, for many years at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT in the AI lab and later co-founded Inquira, which is a, a company. He obtained his PhD in computer science from MIT and we're very you know, lucky to have him as one of our professors at Koch University teaching um, our undergraduate, master and PhD students. So um, before we start the lecture, I just want to give some uh, ground rules for today. As I said, the webinar is being recorded the presentation is a, or the lecture is a recorded lecture. And at the end, Professor um, Denise is going to join us, open his microphone and, and camera and answer your questions. To answer questions, we're not going to be using the raise hand feature of the webinar. We're going to be using the Q&A. So I kindly ask you to please type your questions about the lecture, any questions you have about deep learning and the topics that will be covered during the lecture um, for Professor Yuret in the Q&A. I will be reading the questions and then he will be answering those questions. I will give a brief introduction about the masters in data science because this lecture that we will be watching today is actually um, you know, one of the elective courses of that master non-thesis program available at our university. And we have other webinars already in our YouTube channel and on our website where you can see all the details um, and different questions about the admissions, tuition, scholarships, and other details about that program, okay? So I will move on. Just to give you a very brief overview, uh, the program that we are um, talking about today is a non-thesis program, which is within our Graduate School of Sciences and Engineering. You can see the website address at the top. But besides data science, it's a it's one of our it's our lar largest graduate school in terms of the number of programs offered and number of students and faculty members. And you can see the different um, master and PhD programs in the different disciplines that we um, are offering to both Turkish and international students. The master's in data science, uh, it is a world-class data science program for Turkey, but where we also welcome international students, of course. Um, it is very challenging in terms of the content of the courses that you will be seeing. It's very interdisciplinary, and I will show you what do we mean by that in the next slide. Um, and the idea of this program was that we would create a bridge uh, between the engineering and business worlds for uh, professionals that want to have a career challenge and perhaps pivot in their current roles. 
We also now have um, options for those who wish to take most of or all of the courses um, online, you know, not, not on campus. There's opportunities as well to specialize with one of our 200 plus, we're close now to 300 research labs. If, if you as a student are interested in a very specific area. Um, and this program really is ideal for those of you who have um, very strong uh, mathematics, computer science, computer engineering, and other engineering backgrounds. So um, in terms of the program, I will be very brief and then we will start. Um, it's a one year program to be completed in three semesters um, with 30 credits. There are two core or required courses, which are Introduction to Computational Science and Introduction to Machine Learning. And then um, you can choose up to eight elective courses out of 26 available. What you see there is that you, know, you can choose elective courses related to, of course, computer science and engineering, but also from mathematics, economics, business administration, from our medical school, media and visual arts, and law. And there are some non-credit courses that are still also, I mean, they're also very valuable related, related to academic writing, ethics, and a final project. Here you can see a suggested curriculum of the master's in data science to be completed in three terms. But this is just a suggestion because there is quite a lot of flexibility other than the required courses in terms of the electives that can be taken. This is just, again, some of the elective courses. There are more than that. And today's sample lecture is from one of those elective courses, which is the COMP 541 course on deep learning. So if you want to know more about admission, tuition, scholarship information, I um, invite you to please check the Graduate School of Sciences and Engineering website. You can also email um, at the email address that you see on the screen. And um, especially you can watch previous webinars, uh, which are specifically about admission. So for today, we're going to be um, let's say filtering out, we're not going to be answering questions about admission, tuition, or scholarships. Uh, we want to focus the questions, of course, on the topics of deep learning that will be covered during the sample lecture. Okay, so now I need to um, use not my artificial, but my very um, human intelligence to switch now to the video, which I will be playing now. So we're gonna start the sample lecture um, and we hope that you enjoy it and you learn something new if you're coming from a different field or if you're starting to get familiar in, in this topic that you will also enjoy it. Well, the history of deep learning a little bit, even though deep learning is uh, very um, popular these days and uh, it has been affecting a lot of different technologies. It's actually not a new idea. And in fact, what we find ourselves in right now is the third uh, deep learning revolution, as I will explain. Um, there's a lot of hype in the media. Uh, some people think it's nothing new. Some people think it's the end of the world. Uh, we'll hopefully see by the end of this class, uh, you know, which is closer to reality. So we're going to start by talking about what is machine learning. Uh, of which deep learning is a uh, subcategory, uh, briefly. Uh, some of you may have taken machine learning class. Uh, some of you are seeing this for the first time. But basically, um, machine learning is a new, relatively new way to program computers, where instead of writing an explicit program ourselves, we make the computer learn from examples. Example, input-output um, pairs, let's say. So how does that work? Well, we have, we want the program to, to we want the computer to do something. So let's say uh, translate um, English to Turkish. Okay, so your inputs are English sentences, your outputs are Turkish sentences. And you know that humans can do this. Um, and there's a lot of examples of already translated text lying around. Uh, so you collect a large set of examples on the order of millions of sentences. Um, and you say, okay, you know, here's all the inputs. Some person's brain, in a way I don't understand, was able to understand the X sentences and output the Y sentences. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to model this unknown process with a program. So this program about the history of deep learning a little bit even though deep learning is a very um, 
popular these days and uh, it has been affecting a lot of different technologies. It's actually not a new idea. And in fact, what we find ourselves in right now is the third uh, deep learning revolution, as I will explain. Um, there's a lot of hype in the media. Uh, some people think it's nothing new. Some people think it's the end of the world. Uh, we'll hopefully see by the end of this class, uh, you know, which is closer to reality. So we're going to start by talking about what is machine learning, uh, of which deep learning is a uh, subcategory, uh, briefly. Uh, some of you may have taken machine learning class. Uh, some of you are seeing this for the first time, but basically um, machine learning is a new, relatively new way to program computers where instead of writing an explicit program ourselves, we make the computer learn from examples. Example, input output um, pairs, let's say. So how does that work? Well, we have, we want the program, to, to, we want the computer to do something. So let's say uh, translate um, English to Turkish. Okay, so your inputs are English sentences, your outputs are Turkish sentences. And you know that humans can do this. Um, and there's a lot of examples of already translated text lying around. Uh, so you collect a large set of examples on the order of millions of sentences. Um, and you say, okay, you know, here's all the inputs. Some person's brain, in a way I don't understand, was able to understand the X sentences and output the Y sentences. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to model this unknown process with a program. So this program we will call neural networks at some point or you know deep learning models. Uh, but what it is actually um, is basically a program that is that has lots of parameters that affect its behavior on the order of sometimes thousands, sometimes millions of parameters that affect its behavior. And the operations inside this program, at least in deep learning, uh, are all differentiable. And you will see why this is uh, useful in the next slide. Now, when you first start a project, you initialize this program with random parameters. So each of these operations basically become, for example, multiplying with random matrices and uh, doing other random operations. So as a result, when you give it some input, you will get a totally random output. So I, I denoted this output as uh, with prediction and these Y hats basically show the predicted outputs. And as you may guess, uh, when you first start this program, the outputs are going to be completely random and useless. Then comes uh, what, what's known as the loss function or the error function. That's the next step uh, in our journey to deep learning. So this function basically takes the outputs the real outputs that actually we desire our, our program to generate and the predicted outputs, which I mentioned were initially very random and measure somehow the difference between them. Again, using some differentiable functions. So for uh, regression problems, if the output of your program was a number or a set of numbers, you could, for example, use square difference or mean square difference between the correct outputs and your outputs. If uh, you are predicting a binary output, a true false output, uh, you can have your program generate the probability of the answer being true and then uh, use that probability or more normally negative log of that probability as your uh, loss function. Uh, in the case of categorical outputs like words, what we usually do is we basically have our program generate probabilities for all the words, and then we take the negative log of the correct word probability as our loss function. So this loss function is something that we want to minimize. We want to uh, make it approach zero. As the loss function approaches zero, our outputs are going to be uh, close to the predicted, uh, to the desired outputs. Now, we don't know how to do this by hand, uh, so we don't know what parameters to put into this differentiable program. 
in order to make the outputs uh, close to the desired ones. But what we can do is uh, uh, we can basically take um, a derivative of this loss function with respect to any of the parameters in the program. Okay. So that process of taking derivatives of the loss with respect to a parameter in the program is called the backpropagation algorithm. And I'm going to talk about that in more detail in uh, coming lectures. But basically the meaning of that derivative is what would happen to the loss if I jiggled this particular parameter um, a little bit up or down? Would the loss actually go up or down? And uh, by using that as a sort of training direction, I adjust all of my parameters, very small amounts, some epsilon amount, in the direction that will actually decrease the loss function. And I keep doing this over and over again until my parameters converge somewhere and hopefully uh, the program outputs are fairly close to the desired outputs. So that is basically a brief summary of the whole uh, class. The rest is going to be um, sort of fleshing up the details how we do this. So I'm going to pause here uh, for a couple of minutes for possible questions. There was a lot that I packed into that uh, first introduction, especially if you've never seen machine learning before. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions. Wait uh, silently for wait. This project relates to uh, assignments. Um, yes. Um, let me answer that question at the end of the lecture um, so that we don't divide our attention. So, any, any issues about how the class runs and what you need to do to get a good grade and how to run your project, etc., I'm going to explain at the end. Okay. Any questions about the actual contents of the what we're talking about? Uh, uh, which programming language are we going to use? Uh, we're going to use the Julia language. Um, I will explain the reasons in the next lecture more in more detailed way, but basically my experience is that um, instead of using a framework that has high level operators for deep learning built in, I want you guys to be able to create um, any type of operation or layer or deep learning components from scratch. That's one of the aims of this course. So if you ever you know, get stranded on a desert island or something, you should be able to construct a deep learning model from the stones and twigs that you find around. So that's the level at which I want you to know uh, deep learning. So, and I, I find that uh, using something like PyTorch or TensorFlow uh, promotes bad habits of uh, using all these boxes without understanding what's in them. So you are going to implement everything from scratch in a new language that you will learn just for this class and hopefully use in the future because it's an awesome language. Yes, I'm here. Uh, professor, I have a question. Uh, as you said, uh, there are certain kinds of problems uh, that we cannot uh, program them. Yes. Uh, but my question is, uh, can we, for example, uh, program every possible question using machine learning? For example, uh, writing a program that detects prime numbers with some uh, with some uh, inputs and outputs, and then uh, the program learn to detect prime numbers. Uh, the theoretical answer is yes. The practical answer is yes. However, you need to have enough examples and enough computational power uh, to fit a large enough model to learn the concept that you're trying to learn. Um, but in theory, 
uh, deep learning models are actually universal. So they can do whatever a regular computer can do. Okay. Okay, I understand. All right, so let me keep going. Uh, can I ask something actually? Sure. Uh, what do you mean by differentiable program? I'm not sure if I understand what that means. Um, so what I mean is a program where all the operations have derivatives. So for example, matrix multiplication is okay. Uh, taking the log of something, uh, taking the sign of something, multiplying something with a number, all of these things are okay. So, um, however, using step functions, making discrete decisions are not okay because I don't know how to take derivatives of those. So we will see examples of this in the upcoming lectures. But basically a differentiable program is a program that takes some numbers and outputs some other numbers and every operation in between uh, has a derivative, well defined derivative. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right, so I'm going to now briefly go over some history. Why did I say this is the third deep learning revolution? Well, uh, here is a brief summary. There's, there was a revolution in neural networks in 1960s. There was another one in 1980s. And now we're doing the third one. So let's go take a look at what happened before. So in 1958, uh, we came up with perceptrons. Uh, there weren't any good computers back then, so literally people built these things, Rosenblatt built these things from using telephone wires and stuff. And uh, in the left picture, you can see a huge TV camera looking at a giant uh, letter C, uh, because basically he was testing his machine uh, on learning how to recognize printed letters, which is one of the first assignments we're going to do as well. Um, and this was a great accomplishment because it was the first example of an algorithm that can learn something from examples. Uh, it was modeled after a biological neuron, uh, which basically is a cell in your brain and nervous system uh, that has a body, some dendrites, which act as its inputs, some axon, which acts as its output, uh, and these cells basically transmit electrical signals by accumulating all the signals that come in from dendrites and once those signals pass a certain, certain threshold uh, they send a, a spike down their axon and therefore to other um, cells that are connected to this one uh, with their own dendrites if you actually stick an electron in somebody's brain and listen, you literally see, you know, hear things like uh, um, what you would hear with a telegram operator. You, you hear lots of these uh, spikes going on. So we abstracted this down quite a bit and um, imagined the computational neuron, which is basically what a perceptron is, which uh, at the input takes a bunch of numbers. So the x1, x2, x3 are the inputs. Uh, is my mouse visible, by the way? Yes, sir, John. Yes. Uh, and each of these inputs are multiplied by some weights. W1, W2, those are, these are weights. So these basically um, model the strength of the synaptic connection. So you multiply x1 with W1, x2 with W2, you add it all up. That some sign means you're adding it all up. You can actually have a fixed uh, fixed input here, which uh, is called a bias that is independent of any of the inputs. It's always data, for example. And then you sum all of these things, pass it through a threshold function. If the sum is negative, you output a zero or negative one, depending on the version. If the output is positive, you output a one. So that's the description of a perceptron. Uh, it's not a you know, very complicated program to write. But what is um, amazing is that there is an algorithm that can adjust the weights of this uh, simple program 
to learn anything you want to, anything you can actually represent uh, with, it, with this very limited vocabulary. Here's that algorithm. We're not gonna, I'm going to, you know, look at uh, this in more detail in a couple of lectures. So it's not important uh, that you understand this right now, but it is a very simple algorithm. In particular, uh, you have a incoming X, you predict the Y hat for it, then an output, uh, um, a binary output for it, minus one or plus one. Uh, if w and x, this is a vector multiplication, is positive, you have the plus one, otherwise you have the minus one. And um, if you gave the right answer, you don't do anything. And if you gave the wrong answer, you add uh, x times y to the weights. Okay, that's it. That's the whole algorithm. And you keep doing this example after example after example, and mathematicians actually prove that it can learn anything that um, such a program can actually represent. Yeah. After uh, given enough examples, they actually also came up with how many examples you need in order to learn something. Uh, so uh, people were really excited about this uh, first learning algorithm. Now, what kind of things can the perceptron learn? Well, look at this. So it's basically calculating a linear function of the inputs. Okay, so W1 times X1, W times X2, you add them all up, that's a linear function. And it's passing that through a threshold. It's basically looking whether the result is positive or negative. Now, what kind of function is this if you draw a graph or uh, imagine it in n dimensions? It's actually a, um, a function that maps uh, everything on one side of a hyperplane to plus one and everything on another side of the hyperplane to minus one. So it basically has a flat decision bound. So here's a depiction of this decision boundary. Um, so it's flat. Uh, anything that basically cannot be represented with a flat decision boundary, the perceptron obviously will not be able to learn no matter how many examples we show. Uh, so here's an example of that. So you're trying to distinguish uh, in this silly example cats and dogs, and you know there's an input feature called domestication that goes from zero to one. And there's another input feature called size that goes from zero to one, and you start getting examples. So your first cat is relatively small and domesticated. Dog is huge, uh, and there's a line that separates them. You get another dog. There's a, still a line. You get another dog. There's still a line. But then, you know, you get it. You know, uh, eventually you will get some cat that is too big, or you will get a dog. You know, that is, uh, you know, very domestic and small, etc. And you won't be able to draw this line anymore. And it's at that point, you won't be able to learn uh, this uh, particular concept 100% accurately with a perceptron. This was the topic of a book uh, that one of my advisors, Minsky, wrote in 1969. And it practically ended the excitement uh, that people had about these neural networks for more than a decade. Uh, so um, until 1980s, very few people actually um, worked on neural networks. Most people are were uh, trying to find other models, uh, probabilistic models, symbolic models, etc., uh, to solve AI at the time. So that brings us to the second deep learning revolution. Uh, one idea that people had is basically in order to overcome this linear boundary problem, one thing you can do is you can have multiple layers of perceptrons. So you can have a bank of, let's say, 10 perceptrons in layer one, and then, you know, they take the input, they produce their outputs, and their outputs will go to another bank of, um, let's say, 20 perceptrons, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have layer of, uh, layers and layers of perceptrons, then the functions they can compute are universal. They don't have to compute functions that have uh, linear boundaries. They can compute anything. But even though this is a very simple idea, the reason it took until 1986 for it to catch on is nobody knew how to train them. So remember, one of the crucial ingredients of the perceptron algorithm 
was it was one of the first learning algorithms. It was an algorithm that can learn from examples. Nobody knew how to create a learning algorithm for multiple layers of percent trust. So in 1980s, people basically rediscovered calculus, and uh, this was one of the uh, famous book at the time, um, and figured out how to train these networks using derivatives, like I described in the beginning of this lecture. And they called them artificial neural networks, connectionist models, multilayer perceptrons, they're all the same thing. Um, and so this is a picture of um, what a multilayer neural network looks like. Each of these bubbles is a perceptron, let's say. And uh, each of the ones in the first layer takes two inputs and they produce some output. That output is fed as another input to the next layer, etc., etc. And then you basically get an output Y at the end. Uh, this particular network does not suffer from the linearity constraint that regular perceptrons suffer. In fact, things are even uh, better than that. Um, let me skip to this. Uh, the mathematicians actually proved a theorem called the universal approximation theorem, which says if you have enough perceptrons in your network, there is no limit to what you can compute. So this is the one of the universality uh, theorems that I was mentioning earlier in response to Amir's question. Uh, so not only we solve the nonlinearity problem, but there is basically no boundary that we cannot approach. However, this theorem comes with a few gotchas. One of them is that uh, it says provided uh, enough uh, units in the network. So the number of these units might grow exponentially with the problem size in some instances. And number two, provided enough examples. And we never have enough examples. So in practice, this universality doesn't actually matter that much, but it's nice to know that in, in theory, if you had an infinite number of examples and an infinite number of perceptrons, there isn't anything you can't learn. Um, I skipped over these things because we're going to um, learn this, how to take these derivatives and update the uh, weights, which is called the backpropagation algorithm in more detail in a bit. Um, so this excitement again lasted about 10 years until uh, a, another mathematician, Vapnik, wrote this book on uh, statistical learning theory and he proposed another machine, uh, another model for learning called the support vector machines which became enormously popular in the 90s and practically ended most of the interest in neural networks again because in a lot of simple problems, people tried them on support vector machines actually performed much better. Now, there was a small group of people who still uh, were excited about neural networks. And among their names, we can count Jeff Hinton, Joshua Benjo, Jan Le Kun, which are running huge departments or, you know, been hired by big internet companies now. Uh, and they didn't give up. They, they kept their faith and they kept working on this idea that a um, large number of these interconnected units can be a better learning machine than uh, support vector machines. But one thing that blocked them uh, from success was number one, uh, what they were thinking was only true for problems with lots of examples and lots of dimensions and the computational uh, power at the time did not allow uh, people to experiment with such large-scale problems. Um, and number two, what they were thinking about was true for deeper and deeper networks, so networks with lots and lots of layers. And one of the problems with net networks with lots of layers uh, is that this taking the derivative to update the um, weights business becomes really difficult. So imagine a network uh, that looks like this, but has 100 layers, okay? So there's 100 columns of uh, units going from inputs to outputs. What you're in effect trying to do 
uh, is take a look at one of the weights, let's say in layer five, and say, if I jiggle this weight epsilon up or down, what would happen to the loss 95 layers later, okay? So that's the sort of question we're asking. So obviously, um, not maybe not obvious, but uh, usually uh, what you find in that situation is that the derivatives go to zero and you you get numerical underflows and you cannot actually measure the effect of jiggling this weight uh, on the loss. Therefore, the training algorithm no longer works. So those were the two problems that were uh, facing them. So they had to work on this hard for a couple of decades. And finally, in 2012, uh, the first major success, well, maybe not the first, but the first well-known major success of uh, neural networks uh, came again with deep architectures. Uh, so this came on the ImageNet competition, uh, which was a uh, object recognition competition with uh, the inputs are images and the outputs are, you know, what object is in this image, person, bird, dog, chair, frog, etc. And uh, people, uh, you know, a lot of computer vision groups have been working on this problem since 1960s and uh, they made some progress, but it was still you know, far from solved. Uh, people had a lot of hand-built filters, uh, you know, they analyzed visual systems of mammals and humans and so what kind of cells there were, they tried to model those, etc, etc, and there was a lot of blood and tears and PhDs put into this problem. But then in 2012, suddenly, uh, Alex Krzyzewski, one of the, one of Hinton's uh, students, attended this uh, competition and literally cut the error rate in half. So at the time, the best uh, research teams in the world had um, error rates larger than 25%. And that year, University of Toronto got an error rate of 15%. And that basically woke everybody up and people basically said, oh, you know, there must be something here. And uh, everybody started doing deep learning. So how did they succeed? Uh, as I said, it was a, it was several uh, components. Uh, one is the data set well, was large, the network was deep, uh, Alex was able to hack some GPUs in order to get the training done on time, and there were a bunch of algorithmic tricks to deal with the um, disappearing derivatives problem. So the large data sets, uh, was literally 1.2 million images that were hand labeled. So this was a big expense and uh, a lot of uh, time and effort and money uh, went into preparing this uh, data sets. But it turns out that you need huge data sets in order to show uh, these networks uh, to be advantageous. Uh, the networks were literally um, getting, Alex's network wasn't that large maybe, but they're actually getting ridiculously large these days. You can find networks that are hundreds of uh, layers uh, long, and there's a bunch of algorithmic and um, architectural tricks that actually make them trainable that we will see. GPUs was the third thing I said. Um, GPU is, a, as you know, is a graphical processing unit that uh, teenage boys use to, uh, in their gaming consoles to get more realistic images, uh, but Alex and Hinton basically discovered that the types of operations that you need in order to uh, create realistic images were similar to the types of operations you need to train a neural network. So Alex wrote uh, from scratch in C++, the first neural network training software, and uh, was able to successfully train a convolutional neural network to win this competition. So as you can see, before 2012, nobody's using GPUs. In 2012, there's four teams that tried to use them. And then 2013, 60 teams that participated in this competition, 2014, 110. And now there's nobody in the field of AI pretty much that can get by without using GPUs. So for that reason, um, I have made a 
a lot of investments in GPUs. So by the end of October, we should actually get our new cluster set up. And hopefully within the next, uh, again, by the end of October, I should be able to give each uh, graduate student a laptop with a GPU that can train a neural network. So let me skip this. Uh, so what's been happening since then? <clears throat> so briefly, um, uh, there are some videos here. There are some fun videos that I'm going to skip ahead because we're running. I don't want to run out of time. But uh, people use deep learning to beat uh, people in games, like uh, old Atari games. And then more impressively, they actually beat uh, the human champion uh, in Go, which was thought to be a, a game that was too deep for AI uh, to outwit humans. Uh, we all have heard about self-driving cars. If you buy a Tesla right now, you, you can practically um, drive it on a nice highway uh, without touching the wheel. It still has a lot to learn before it can actually drive itself in Istanbul. Um, people have uh, used this technology in robotics. Uh, they made these little simulated machines that can learn to walk, jump, etc. There's still a long way to go. So whenever somebody says, oh, robots are going to take over, let me show you at least this one video. So this is uh, from the latest DARPA robot competition. So this is the state of, you know, our robotic overlords right now. Turns out that uh, being able to move and uh, coordinate yourself is really, really hard, uh, even with the help of deep learning. And we still don't have robots that can actually uh, move around in your house and you know wash your dishes and help you uh, with these mundane tasks. Um, however, I should also point out that uh, the first DARPA competition for self-driving cars also looked just as bad. And within 10 years, uh, we had actually cars that can drive themselves at least in highways, so uh, progress can come fast. All right. Um, adversarial examples, we're going to talk about this in a future lecture. Speech recognition is every, in everybody's life right now. We have, you know, Siri, Alexa, uh, Google Assistant that I'm sure many of you are using. Machine translation is getting better and better. Um, you may not know this or have followed this, but basically I can assure you that each one of these technologies is a lot better uh, than what they were five years ago. Five years ago, they were all unusable. Right now, they're sort of semi-usable and they're, they're slowly passing the usable threshold. And that's why all these big uh, companies are interested because uh, first time in history, some of these technologies have become good enough to introduce to humans. Uh, in my research group, I'm interested in multimodal uh, problems where there's more than one modality being uh, understood. So here's an example for image captioning. So these are some of the pictures that you give as input to a deep learning system and the text is the textual description description that it generates. Um, this is another uh, describing what you see from video type of work. You can watch the video you know, all the time, uh, describing videos. Uh, in the other direction, you can basically uh, imagine a scene. Somebody can describe you a scene in natural language and you can basically put together a 3D scene uh, with the objects and um, items described. Uh, learning language is uh, a long time uh, interest of mine. So uh, in this work, for example, uh, we, we are learning language to navigate a particular maze. So we you know, somebody created a data set by having a bunch of students play, play this game where one student knows where the treasure is in this map and he describes to the other student, you know, go to the lamp, turn right, etc. Uh, and the other student follows the instructions. You take recordings of these hundreds of times and then you pair each sentence with the action a human 
hearing that sentence too. And you give that as input to a deep learning system um, who basically on the, slowly learns what go forward means, what left means, what turn right means, etc., and can follow and understand your instructions in any language it's been trained on. Uh, language models started getting really good. You may have heard of GPT-3 recently, uh, being able to write very human sounding text. People have interviewed them for magazines, uh, created applications like um, text-based games, which give you very creative, realistic descriptions of scenes and you can, um, you can basically take these games and uh, direct them in any direction you want. They're becoming good narrators. So understanding and generating stories is another you know, research area that I'm very interested in. Uh, this was actually, I just saw this a couple days ago. This is the intro of the MIT deep learning course. And I just wanted to show you this. Oops. Uh, we have no sound. It's not good. It's because I can't. Okay, so I'm going to open my video again and share my screen again. Thank you for staying with us and also um, for, let me just share my screen here. Okay, um, yeah, I hope you have enjoyed the sample lecture. Uh, Professor Denis Yuret is with us now, so I'm going to kindly ask him to open his microphone. Uh, to say hello, and uh, I have done a, a brief introduction. So when Hi. I... Hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me say, it doesn't let me open my video, so okay. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Let me, okay. I can do that so that I can allow you to open your video. Okay. Just... Bear with me one second. Okay, so you should be able to open your camera now, I think. Yes. Yes, perfect. Great. Thank you. And I see that you, you know, uh, we are at the at the Coach University. Virtually. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Professor Denise. Uh, we do have some um, questions from the participants. Let me just check. Uh, okay, so there are 
some questions here. So again, just as a reminder, we have now finished the sample lecture part of today's webinar. Um, if you have questions about the topics of deep learning, some of the introductory concepts or examples that were given during the lecture for Professor um, Denise Uret, please do type them on the uh, question and answer part. I will also check the chat part in case you have uh, written some questions there. Um, there is a participant here who says that they want to work on AI UAV, artificial intelligence on manned aerial vehicles, and UGV, artificial intelligence on, mount, on manned ground vehicle. Um, I guess his question is whether it's possible to do research on these fields at Koch University. Yes, uh, in particular, Fatma Güney Hoca uh, has a project, European Union project, working on uh, self-driving cars right now. Uh, there, there, Boris Hoca uh, specializes in robotics. Uh, we have four or five other faculty uh, working on different uh, areas of machine vision, which is a crucial technology for self-driving cars. So, uh, in summary, yes, and uh, I can, I can, you know, send the contacts of the uh, professors working in these areas, or you can, you guys can check out our website, where we list all the research uh, topics. Great. Um, there is a question here. How to choose the number of layers? Um, you, it's trial and error now. Unfortunately, our mathematical theory hasn't caught up with the um, deep learning practice yet. It's been, a, as I mentioned, a gold mine. Uh, everybody's rushing to get better results at old problems or solve new problems that weren't attempted before. And uh, so basically, um, number of layers uh, is uh, an example of something we call a hyperparameter. So these include other design uh, parameters like in what learning rate to use or how wide should the layers be and whether you should be using convolution or you know fully connected layers, etc. So all of these things are actually optimized on a per data set basis or using the best practices of people that came before you. So it's very problem dependent and there wouldn't be any uh, easy way to answer the question. Having said that, uh, there are ways to diagnose and debug neural network systems. So if you actually fail at your first attempt at learning the problem that you're working on, then uh, there is techniques you can use that will suggest, oh, you know, using a larger layer or more layers would help in this case, but they wouldn't help in this other case. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question. What does I am Janet or Janet refer to? I am not sure. Okay. The way that it's written here is I am the capital I, capital M, Janet, G E N E T. I, I will ask uh, the person who wrote the question, uh, Haula, to please maybe type the question again. In the meantime, uh, there's another question. Maybe somebody here. type ImageNet. Ah, ImageNet. Okay. 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 So ImageNet is a large data set of labeled images. Uh, so the task uh, this data was collected for is image classification. That is the task of looking at a photograph and telling if there is a dog or a cat or a human in the photograph. Uh, there is about a thousand categories that each photograph has been labeled with. And there's about a million photographs. So it was a very large and expensive data set to generate, but it did lead to the um, you know, big advances in computer vision that we see today. Um, there is a question. If I use large a large data set like deep learning data set for machine learning algorithms, will this increase the accuracy for machine learning algorithms? So when you say machine learning algorithms, you probably mean uh, things outside of deep learning, like uh, you know, random forests or other algorithms. Um, Yes, more data will always help, uh, especially with generalization. Um, however, more data will not help if the expressive power of your model is limited. So just like I, I uh, gave you guys the perceptron example, which is a very simple machine, uh, there is a limit to what you can learn. And some of the machine learning algorithms you might be familiar with may have their own limits. And if, if you're basically utilizing the machine at its limit, adding more data won't help. Adding more data helps, though, if your machine is, uh, has enough capacity to represent um, the complexities of the problem. Thank you. 
I'm going to switch to the question and answer uh, box. We have a question from a Turkish participant. Um, can we build our own Turkish language data sets by scraping data from news websites? Thank you. Yes, we, uh, you can and we do all the time. So there's a Boğaziçi University web corpus. Uh, there is a company in England called, um, um, I'll remember their name uh, later, but they have uh, 10 billion words of Turkish data scraped from the web. Um, yes, so that is what we use for Turkish language research usually. I am actually working on a project uh, where we're going to create a website to share uh, these uh, computational linguistics resources for Turkish very soon. Uh, I think it's going to be called tdd.ai, Turkish Data Depository. Um, and uh, we're going to basically try to share uh, all Turkish resources uh, useful for AI on this website. Okay. Thank you. There is an interesting question here. Can we put AI in weapons? Yes, we can. Hopefully we, do, we won't. Um, right now, I mean, the, um, um, you know, obviously self-driving vehicles and, and, you know, unmanned aerial and land vehicles are an obvious um, choice, but it doesn't have to, you know, stop there. Um, you know, uh, people can take things to extremes. And, uh, you know, some of the guided missiles and weapons like this already use um, probably, uh, you know, vision algorithms to track their um, targets and stuff. So unfortunately, the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, we have another kind of big question from one of the uh, Turkish participants. What is the current big challenge for the deep learning field? Um, so uh, there are multiple challenges right now. Um, but I think to me, one of the most important big challenges is uh, language understanding. Um, even though the current AI systems do uh, process and produce language that is useful for most tasks, if you actually dig a little deeper, you will find that their understanding is really shallow. Um, the, the language they're using is not um, grounded in reality and experience. And you can always uh, exploit that weakness to, to uh, show, uh, show them to be brittle. So that is one of the, uh, I think, next uh, milestones that we will uh, topple, hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Another question from one of our Turkish participants. Is the number of nodes fixed in a system? Is it possible to develop an algorithm that increases or decreases the number of nodes as needed? Okay, so 90% of the time, the answer is yes, they're fixed. Uh, of course, the, um, during experimentation, the number of nodes is increased or decreased by a grad student, usually, who, who's trying to find the optimal number of nodes to use. But there are also algorithms which automatically try to uh, play with the number of nodes or the connections among the nodes. Um, so they're generally called architecture search algorithms. Um, so these algorithms try to play with the form of the neural network uh, to see uh, automatically to find out which, which forms of neural network uh, uh, work better. So you can Google the keywords neural architecture search. Thank you. Um, sample lecture was great. One of our international participants, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. I want to know, is there any computer information security machine learning related projects uh, done so far? I guess he's referring to your group or the groups that you are um, you know, uh, in collaboration with. Yes, uh, in security, we have um, a couple of um, uh, faculty working on this. Uh, and in fact, there is a uh, course that we offered this semester, we're offering this semester about um, privacy and security. And part of the course is actually dedicated to AI methods uh, that are used in privacy and security. Okay. Uh, another question here. Can you compare the penetration of AI in various industries in Europe and the US? To what extent um, uh, in which, in which you know, uh, region is it more prevalent, I guess? Uh, that, that's a sort of shifting target. So I, I am not quite sure um, that I have the correct answer to this. Uh, but right now we're still sort of 
uh, in the middle of another AI spring. So everybody's excited about AI. Everybody wants some AI in their own application or product. Um, so the, the, that, the answer to that question is changing daily. So I don't want to, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the exact answer as of this date. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the examples where it has most penetrated um, are, you know, big information companies, obviously Google and Facebook and Apple are, are using AI in a big way. Um, real life applications, uh, you know, the Roomba vacuum cleaner and Tesla self-driving cars uh, are the other uh, big thing. Um, so those are the obvious applications that come to my mind. And also we can actually count the recent success of DeepMind uh, in protein folding. So in a lot of um, health and medicine applications, uh, the use of AI is also increasing. Great. Um, there is a question here from one of our Turkish participants. My question is, can machines dream and learn from those dreams instead of samples? I wonder because it is not possible to get large data from all the problems we're trying to solve. There is a physiology experiment that there are two groups. One is playing uh, basketball and the other group is just dreaming that they're playing. After that process, they play the game and see that the group dreaming is as good as the group playing the game in real time other than dreaming. At the end, humans can learn only by dreaming. So very, wow, interesting question. Um, and the title I, of a book, Can, can Robots uh, uh, Dream of uh, Sheep or Count Sheep, I think. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, so I am skeptical highly about the basketball example, uh, because I typically uh, tell my students in the beginning of the semester that you can't learn basketball just by you know having me lecture you or thinking about it or uh, reading books about it. You have to actually get your hands dirty and get the physical experience. But I do believe that dreaming and sleep definitely has an enormous impact on human learning and consolidation of information uh, in your brain. Uh, there are sort of things that are like dreaming in the machine learning um, side, uh, but I would not be, um, I would not be comfortable calling them exactly dreaming because we don't know exactly how sleep and dreaming works in humans in order to make that judgment. But yes, you can basically, after you start training a network, you can basically use it to generate its own, um, uh, its own output, uh, its own inputs. And uh, people have done great, uh, generate great works of abstract art uh, using this technique that they call neural network dreaming. Okay. We have a question from one of our international participants. Which language is used in laser guided systems, uh, machine vision and self-driving -drive, self vehicles, Python or C? I mean, these are um, three, three areas and um, which uh, languages are used in those? So there are, um, so all, all, you know, all possible languages are used in all possible projects. So I don't want to uh, um, give the false impression, but I do believe that most deep learning research right now uses Python. Um, and whenever they need efficiency and speed, they switch to C++. And I'm personally using a language called Julia that basically combines the advantages of both. Um, but yes, there is many uh, different uh, languages and frameworks used uh, to create uh, deep learning technology. Um, another question from a Turkish participant. Elon Musk says that to reach AI progress, human brains should interact with computers such as Neuralink. What do you think about it? Also, is there any overlap between AI and neuroscience? Um, so the second question, let me answer first. Yes, of course, there is a, you know, all AI researchers I know are avid followers of neuroscience. Uh, they take inspiration from neuroscience. Uh, however, unfortunately, new, in neuroscience, we're very, very um, still at the, you know, very early stages of understanding what's going on in the human brain. So we, that, therefore, we can find some inspiration uh, from neuroscience, but we don't, typically have uh, detailed answers yet from neuroscience. Um, the brain interface uh, problem is definitely interesting. Um, you know, I, 
sometimes wish I can, you know, send emails and do work in my head instead of, you know, getting stuck in front of the Zoom screen all day. On the other hand, it also brings with it uh, issues of privacy and security. So I don't know if I want a hackable chip uh, that I cannot actually uh, get rid of in my brain. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see how that develops. But I will uh, probably be one of the early adapters if it becomes available. <laughs> the guinea, one of the guinea pigs for this. That's right, that's right. Brave new world. Um, there's a question here. How do you think AI will impact software development jobs? Do you think creative work like software development can be automated in the near future? Um, so it's going to, so, okay, Andre Karpati, who is the, you know, one of the scientists at uh, Tesla uh, calls this deep learning technology software 2.0. So I don't think it's going to replace software developers. It's going to change what they do. So the typical uh, mode of software development is you see a problem, you figure out an algorithm and you basically type explicit instructions to uh, the machine in order to solve this problem. And more and more what we're seeing with deep learning is that you see a problem, you collect lots of data about that problem and then you feed that into a hungry neural network and then the neural network basically becomes your program. So it's a different way of software engineering. And I think it's going to become more and more the standard uh, to solve various problems. Um, largely because number one, some of the problems that deep learning solves, we still don't know how to you know, write algorithms for. And number two, it just uh, is going to get smarter and smarter over time. Uh, we did make some progress in programming languages and ease of programming uh, since the advent of uh, programmable computers, but programming is still a very difficult and um, um, unnatural thing for humans to learn to do, but training a machine uh, uh, is a lot more uh, scalable uh, compared to just your regular good old program. So more and more of the software systems will be replaced by uh, learning components and managing those learning components and feeding them data, training them, etc., will become, uh, you know, one of the top jobs of the software engineers. Great, thank you. We have now a long question with like three questions into well, from one person. Um, and I'm mindful of the time, so to make sure that we uh, finish on time. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Denise, for taking the time to answer all these questions. So okay. here it goes. Um, is it possible that AI can actually do scientific research and experiments? Um, yes, it is, and it, it, it has. So let's do it them one by one. Um, so there are actually, um, um, there are robots which perform then, uh, experiments in mass. So, uh, and there's all AI systems which sort of generate scientific hypotheses and uh, figure out ways to test them. Uh, there, I don't think there is any you know, mind blowing results where AI has discovered something that human scientists haven't yet. Um, but uh, I think it's basically definitely within the realm of possibility. Great. So the second question is, um, in the lecture you have shown um, about the proficiency gained by AlphaGo with, I assume, reinforcement learning. But chess or Go, like games, have predefined rules. Um, are these two problems related? Um, yes, in fact, uh, after developing AlphaGo, DeepMind wrote a more advanced version called AlphaZero. And AlphaZero, unlike its predecessors, um, um, can learn different games. And to prove this, they basically trained it on Go and on chess separately. And it basically performed at the world champion level uh, in, in both games using the same algorithm. Um, there is also studies on, you know, meta games where uh, you have a single algorithm that has the ability to learn uh, about the rules of a new game and then uh, become proficient at this new game. Uh, so general answer is yes. Right. Okay. Um, then uh, last question, uh, which is, can math, maths or physics related grad programs offer a broader perspective for people aiming for research in AI than rather than uh, computer science or data science programs? Like what would be a good um, choice for somebody who wants to have a broader perspective 
uh, for research in AI? So I wouldn't say rather than, but I would say in addition to. Um, so I think the perfect background uh, for a, a AI researcher or data scientist is a very strong um, computer science background coupled with uh, a decent amount of math or physics uh, so that you actually learn you know, how to model systems quantitatively and mathematically, um, so which allows you to analyze, for example, the uh, original uh, machine learning methods and architectures that you generate. Uh, but the computer science part is also important because if you can't implement something and you can't play with it, you can't build any intuition. So you should be able to, um, you know, have the computer do whatever you want. You have the ability to, you know, uh, have the computer do your bidding in order to a, to a successful um, research project in AI. I think a related question here is what would you recommend for a sophomore um, in terms of developing skills in the field of deep learning and artificial intelligence? Um, so there is, if that's the field that you want to concentrate on, there is tons of online material. You know, all my classes are online. Um, there's tutorials, um, articles, YouTube channels, all dedicated to this. So, you know, don't ask for permission, just dive in and, uh, you know, build your own projects. Uh, you know, write your own programs. That is the best way to learn. Um, and you know, there is no like, you know, there is no requirement, you know, or prerequisite to actually uh, start this. A little bit of math and a little bit of programming is all that is needed to start learning more about AI. I think that kind of answers another question here, uh, which was, do you think one has to have a PhD to work as a deep learning? engineer or in the field of deep learning as a in an applied in an applied way no um, i think a phd by definition means somebody who contributed something original and new to the field uh, but if you if you want to you know work as a successful engineer that does not necessarily require you to invent something um, original it just requires you to master existing technologies and methods so that you can apply them well. Uh, so I would say, no, a PhD is not required. But this being such a young field and changing every day so rapidly, um, a PhD, on the other hand, I, I, I think would be recommended just so that you have a chance to follow the technology's developments uh, during your uh, PhD uh, days. And then that will give you the skills necessary to follow it and learn by yourself um, as a research engineer or development engineer. Um, we have one question here. Um, one comment you made is that deep learning will replace procedural algorithms to solve problems. Most software development is nowadays not about solving problems, but building things. Can AI build like backend systems? Thank um, you. I don't know if I made that uh, claim that strongly. Um, yes, I, I mentioned software 2.0, but we're not at the stage where we can actually replace all our programs and operating systems yet. Uh, but I think um, I see the world moving in that direction. Yes. Will we ever get rid of handwritten programs completely? Probably not. Uh, but more and more of the functions, for example, in your laptop will be managed by um, AI backed. Uh, systems rather than handwritten uh, systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question from uh, an international participant. Can we use machine and deep learning in Internet of Things and how? I guess some examples. Um, probably the answer is yes. I'm not an expert on Internet of Things, mm -hmm. uh, but basically the, the more things are connected, uh, you know, together, the more data they generate. And when there is more data, there is an opportunity for um, doing some AI work that will increase the usefulness of these products. But yes, again, I'm not an expert, so um, I, I can't say for sure. Okay. Um, we had a couple of questions that are kind of asking the same thing, whether computer engineering as a bachelor's degree uh, is enough to work later on AI on whether computer science uh, would be a you know a better uh, track or field than computer engineering would it be enough? Uh, so 
In my mind, there is no difference between the computer science and computer engineering degrees. It's just a naming convention. Some countries like engineering, so they call all their departments computer engineering. And some countries, specifically the US, uh, you know, calls most of their departments computer science. If you look at the curriculums, they're basically practically the same most of the time. Uh, so I would focus on the quality of the institution rather than the name of the department. Um, uh, another question here, Professor uh, Denise, is the singularity er era real or is, do you think it's possible it will happen? Okay, so it's a, you know, it's a you know, nice speculation uh, based on the assumption that the exponential growth that we see in some technologies today will continue. Um, however, when you're in the beginning of an exponential, uh, you don't know how, how long it's going to last and when it's going to turn into an S-curve. And every exponential in the universe has to turn into an S-curve because you know, otherwise we would run out of um, you know, time and space and energy in the universe. Um, so, so yeah, that's why I, I, I'm skeptical, but I, I, like, um, I like the speculations in this uh, area. Okay. okay. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. If not, uh, I think then we're going to wrap up for today. Um, I want to share a couple more things. Oops, here. So um, the background that you see is the same picture that I'm actually using on this slide. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot of very nice pictures of this new research center um, laboratory that we have at the Ish uh, Bankasi Towers here in Istanbul. Uh, you can see the website for our artificial intelligence laboratory there. I invite you all to take a look. You can see all of the professors, some of the professors uh, that uh, uh, Professor Denise mentioned today, you can see their profiles there. And uh, they have started a very, very interesting, interesting podcast uh, called the Q and AI uh, podcast. And you can see if you follow them on Twitter, you can find the links of where you can uh, you know, like hear the podcast and they have, I think they have done uh, three or four episodes now, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but I do invite you to, yeah, to follow the Twitter account. Um, also, they have an Instagram account and you can see all the details about the, the laboratory there. And I do hope that we can start welcoming, um, you know, students and researchers in the future at the lab uh, facilities. So um, last thing for today, you can see the contact details if you want to find out more about our graduate school of social sciences, all of our graduate programs, uh, not only in data science, but also, for example, in computer sciences and engineering, computational sciences and engineering that we have in the graduate school. You can see their um, social uh, links there. If you're an international participant today and you have specific questions, uh, again, about admissions or any other requirements, feel free to get in touch with us via email. And it's always better because we can, you can explain in detail your situation and we can try to find an, an answer for you um, very quickly. So um, I just want to check if there's no any, if there are no any, not any other questions. I think not. Uh, yes, uh, we will share the recording uh, with you. So if you have um, one of the participants from Turkey, if you registered for the webinar and that's why you're here, you will receive an email um, two days later with the link to the recording, which is also hosted on our YouTube channel. You can find it also on Coach University International Admissions. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. Okay, uh, we did not answer any questions related to admissions to the program today because we have a separate webinar about, about that and you can check it and you can see the website. So with that, I want to thank you so much, Professor um, Denise, for joining us today. Uh, you, you have no idea how busy he is every day. So taking the time to answer your questions, uh, it is very appreciated. And thank you all of you for uh, also coming and joining us today. So with that, I'm going to um, stop share and make myself host again so that we can uh, end today's presentation, if I can. Melissa, if you can, before yeah. I, I leave, um, yeah. if you can also share the recording with me, I yeah. will make sure that it's be, it's added to the AI website and Perfect. social media accounts, etc. Okay, we'll do that. We have a lot of uh, thank you messages from everyone uh, thank now. You no, thank thank you really for joining us. So we don't want to take more time today. Uh, so 
with that, I'm going to ask Professor Denise to then click on and meeting for all. Is that okay? All right. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.